Okay, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm Joe, he's Nick, and you are listening to the Nick and Joe Show, uh, coming to you live from the Think Radio Broadcast Centre in Canada's national capital of Ottawa in Ontario, where we are just hours, hours away from the coming into force of the pseudo-quasi uh, curfew otherwise known as the stay-at-home order. But we're not going to talk about that right now. That'll be for the next segment of of this show. Uh, if you're listening live, you want to get involved in the chat room, then uh, you have to log on. Just click on the chat bubble on the player. And uh, if you have to log on or if you have to register, that's fine. Just go ahead and do that. Don't worry. We don't sell your name. We don't use it. We don't give it to big tech. Not that, And we don't let, even let them take it from us. Although, you know, I suppose if they hacked into somebody's system somewhere, you know, I, as they say, nobody could prevent this stuff 100%, but we try our best. And uh, where am I going with this? Oh, yeah, that's just to make sure that you're a flesh and blood human being. And here is Nick. Nick is live at Bunker F, the farm. He is. Oh, and Nick is echoing away, and there's a reason for that, and that is because I have to... Just click off a, oh, uh, what am I clicking off here, Nick? I don't know. Okay, there we go. Are you still there, Nick? Oh, I hope so. Okay, there you go. Your echo's gone. I had your, I had double microphone, or double headphones on here in the studio. Uh, anyway, well, that would, that would you good. know, oh my goodness gracious, Nick, I, I we just, you know, we just can't get away from any of this stuff. Uh, you know, as much as we want to, uh, it just it just seems that, you know, there's no... I don't know what to say. Um, I'm thinking here, of course, I'm referring to the situation down in the United States. Now, before we get into this too much, Joseph, first of all, he's only got a week left. And this is the overriding thing that's been bugging me about this for the last, you know, every time I think about it. He's down to his last few days. You've won in every, I'm talking to the Democrats, you won in every corner. What possible point would there be to pursuing this uh, impeachment now? You won. That's like... Spiking the ball in front of the your in front of the home the, the home team after you beat them on their own field, and then spiking it again when there's nobody around. You've won. The game's over. Move on. Like yeah. this is a huge distraction to what's going on. Uh, you know they've got all kinds of problems down there to deal with, and yet this is what they want to spend their time on, going after Donald Trump because he still he's still president. They can't, you know, they can't hold their breath for, for uh, seven days and, and just let him ride out the last seven days of his term. This is crazy. Well, the, the, the U.S. House of Representatives did pass today, this afternoon, articles of impeachment against him. Now, I haven't followed the news closely enough, so I don't know whether or not they've sent those over to the Senate uh, yet. But, of course, once they send them over to the Senate then the Senate is going to have to make a decision uh, as to whether or not they're going to uh, organize a, a an impeachment trial. But I just don't see how they have enough time to do that. So you're quite right. If 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 the idea here is to get rid of Trump, get him out of office, uh, just shut up. And you know what? What really bothers me about this, you know, Nick, is... And, and by the way, you know, I, I, I just want to make clear again... Yeah, you know, we don't have a dog in this hunt. Yeah, you know, we're we're up here in Canada, so in the end, what what they do politically down in the states, you know, it doesn't have a whole lot of of effect here. So, but I guess what's bothering me is exactly what you're saying is, you know, I I see this as 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 a an ideological battle, um, more than just simply a political battle, and the kinds of things that I see manifest in the behavior of the Democrats in the states. Uh, and some of the the more left wing Republicans uh, is that you know they 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 don't they talk big but they don't walk the walk you know they talk the talk as the saying goes but they don't walk the walk uh, and for instance 
uh, you know, they talking about they're talking about how we have to come together. We have to reunify the country. We have to uh, make peace with one another. You know, can't we all get along? Kumbaya, that kind of stuff, right? Uh, all very fine and dandy. Well, they're the and, architect and, and all that. And and it's that's not an it's not an unreasonable uh, um, aim for them to have coming into government. Let's heal the nation. It's been a particularly trying time. But, you know, I think you hit the nail on the head just now. They are the principal architects of whatever the uh, uh, the arguing and the fighting that's gone on over the course of the past uh, four years. And, and now here they have an opportunity to demonstrate their maturity, their ability to, that they... They actually believe in what they're saying, uh, and 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 what do they do? They 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 impeach Trump three days, three sitting days before he leaves, or four days before he leaves office. Now, in fairness, I'm going to make one observation, and that is that there is a practical uh, aspect to this, Nick. The practical aspect being that if they have a trial, they th- there's a question of whether or not they can actually have an impeachment trial after he leaves office. If they can, and if they do, and he's convicted, quote-unquote, then my understanding is that he can't run for office again uh, in, two, in 2024. And he's been musing about this. So this is just a, a way uh, of of not just rubbing it in, but there is a practical outcome to this but I, I guess that's what the whole thing that bothers me about this is the the rank hypocrisy and the fact that these guys don't see it or that their supporters don't see it and and that their their offices now that they're they've had an election there's new people there and and that the their own supporters aren't flooding them with emails and letters and Facebook messages and uh, telephone calls, etc., telling them to grow up uh, and and get on with what you were elected to do, which was to what do a better job re- in reaction to the COVID nineteen pandemic or whatever you know whatever you were elected to do. You didn't run to have a mandate to re impeach President Trump, okay, or to impeach him a second time. You, that's not you, nobody said that they were going to do that before the election. So, so you're, you started talking about how this whole impeachment thing was a waste of time and etc. Et and I and I agree with you. Uh, and of course, there's the whole hypocrisy thing. Uh, but you know, on on the hypocrisy side of things, Nick, um, one of the things that we started hearing right away when they had these riots uh, in Washington uh, in the the storming of the U.S. Capitol last Wednesday after afternoon, what we started hearing right away was that, uh, first of all, they were describing it as an insurrection. And I've heard since already, you know, failed coup d'etat, etc. And and I have to tell you, just to get it off my chest, this has got to have been the most inefficient, comical, keenstone cops coup d'etat in history. Because you don't do a coup d'etat by taking over the legislative building you do a coup d'etat by taking over the communications hubs, which would mean radio, television, and that kind of thing. Of course, it's much harder to do that with the internet these days, but, you know, it's simply taking over uh, as a demonstration and rioting in the, in, the, in the Capitol building is not a coup d'etat. So again, it's another example of exaggerated and indeed corrupted language. Uh, and that and inflammatory. And that doesn't help anything or it doesn't help anyone. But the real problem, the way I see it, Nick, the real problem here is that everybody blamed Trump. And and I watched the speech, and I think I said last week when we talked about it, that he did use some incautious language, given the fact that he had to know that the, the, there were segments, that there had to be people in the crowd that were riled up, blood pressure up, you know, um, ready for action, so to speak. And that some of the language that he used, while maybe not intending to encourage violence, that it could in time, in, in turn, uh, incite that kind of behavior. 
And so I thought that he had acted a little imprudently, a little incautiously, and therefore bore some of the responsibility for what happened. Now, I'm not retracting that, but I am saying that in the interim, in the last week, and especially in the last few days, we now know from authorities like the the FBI that they knew that there was going to be some sort of violence. They had already heard about plans. They had uh, some intelligence about this, which, which means that it was planned and it was going to happen irrespective of anything that Donald Trump said or didn't say. And therefore, it's not reasonable to hold him responsible for the violence. Uh, now, if it wasn't Donald Trump and if, it, if people were not infected with Trump derangement syndrome, far more dangerous, I think, and far more prevalent than this COVID-19 pandemic that we're dealing with. Uh, If we didn't have that, probably nobody would be saying this, but the hatred is so visceral, so intense against Trump that, uh, that they're willing to do and say anything just, you know, on his way out of office, just to give him a couple of more slaps on the back of the head and, you know, a kick to the seat of the pants or, or worse. And it's really quite unbecoming. And I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that the everybody on the left really appreciates the damage that they're doing to their own country through this behavior, through, or that the leaders, that the, that the voters on the left are really appreciative of the intense damage that they're doing to their own reputation and the reputation of the country through this behavior as well. Yeah, there's, you're, you're right on all those points. <clears throat> what we need to understand is that when the Democrats have done, are doing as much damage uh, to the country as any force within that country. Uh, they're divisive. They're causing violence. They're inciting it. Like when Maxine Waters tells people to storm the White House or the Capitol building, nobody ever charges her with sedition or insurrection. Uh, But Trump obliquely refers to, you know, okay, let's go to the White House, or let's go protest on Capitol Hill, which is where everybody protests anyway. Like when they have the the Million Man March, where was it? When they have the March for Life, where is it? You know, these kinds of things, that's where you go. I I don't uh, understand him to uh, be saying that, okay, it's time to kick in the doors, and take the keys away from those who have it. I don't. I didn't see that at all. Uh, it was a completely. And the other frustrating thing about this is so many people are still getting their information from the mainstream media, and now maybe they don't understand how deep the hatred is for Trump within that circle. Um, that it would skew everything they say about the man. You can't trust anything coming out of the mainstream media on this topic, on a lot of topics, but especially this one. So when you have a conversation with somebody, and as soon as you mention that it was uh, fanned and, and a lot of the people involved in the violence were from Antifa, okay, I'm out, that's it, game over. You know, they don't want to talk about it because they think you're a nut because that's what the mainstream media has been telling them. And they buy into it. And they don't ever say, well, what makes you say that? Which would lead to an intelligent conversation. They're not interested in that. So this is where you can have all the facts on your side and still lose because they're engaged in one of the most effective debating tools of the 21st century and the late 20th century, and that is emotion. They, they, they just get so emotional that they drown out the logic and the common sense and the reason that cooler heads should be able to prevail with. And when you have that, how do you talk to somebody who's so upset that they're willing to say the most outrageous things to you about 